Hello and welcome to the Potters House Church Brisbane's live stream services. We're so thankful that you could join us today and our service is about to begin in three minutes starting now. So take this time to grab your Bible and prepare your hearts to hear a word from God today. Thank you. Our service is just about to begin. While you're waiting, take this time to like our video, subscribe to our channel, and follow us on social media, and check us out at www.pottershousebrisbane.com. Thank you and enjoy our service. Church, welcome out to the workshop this morning. Let's praise God. Hallelujah. One, two, three, four. Come on, clap your hands. Sing it out. Making a war in the heavenlies, tearing down principalities, standing firm in Jesus' victory. Making war in the heavenlies, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, sing it again. Come on. Making war in the heavenlies, tearing down principalities, standing firm, Jesus' victory. Making war in the heavenlies. Passing down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Sing it out. We do not bow our knee. We do not bow our knee to the Prince of the air. We know the truth has set us free. And under our feet, He will surely be. Having the know will stand in victory, making war in the heavenlies, tearing down principalities, standing firm in 
in Jesus victory come on make it war making war in the heavenlies casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ sing it out our hearts are set apart our hearts are set apart for the courts of the Lord we will not be bought or sold by His Spirit in us. He will overcome. Come on, we're pulling down, pulling down every strong hold. Making war in the heavenlies, tearing down principalities, standing firm. Come on, in Jesus' victory. Warrior in the heavenlies, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, sing it again, come on. Making war in the heavenlies, tearing down principalities, standing firm in Jesus' victory. Yeah. Making war in the heavenlies. Casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, that exalts itself. That exalts itself against the knowledge of God. One more time. That exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's keep praising God this morning, church. Sing it out. I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. That of the flies across this land. That all men must see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. I want to see Jesus lifted high. That of the flies across this land. That all men must see the truth and know. That he is the way to Come on, sing it out. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see. I want to see. I want to see Jesus lifted high. Oh, sing it again from the top. I want to see. I want to see Jesus lifted high. The banner that flies across this land. That all men must see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. I want to see Jesus lifted high, the banner that flies across this land. That all men must see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. Come on, look for I want to see, I want to see, I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see, I want to see. I want to see all oh, step by step, step by step, we're moving forward, little by little, we're taking ground. Every prayer is a powerful weapon, strongholds come tumbling down and down and down. Sing it out, I want to see, I want to see, I want to see, I want to see Jesus lifting high. I want to see, I want to see. I want to see all oh, step by step, come on. Step by step, we're moving forward. Little by little, we're taking ground. Every prayer is a powerful weapon. Strongholds come tumbling down and down. Oh, come on, lift your voice and say, I want to see, I want to see, I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see, I want to see. I want oh one more time come on I want to see I want to see I want to see I want to see Jesus lifted high I want to see I want to see I want to see Jesus lifted high Oh hallelujah Thank you Jesus Oh yes come on church in the presence of the Lord why don't we lift our hands Let's come 
humbly before his throne. God, we bow our hearts before you. Oh, sing it out on bended knee I come. church this Sunday morning. Let's worship our God. Yes, awesome is the sight of your holiness, Lord. Oh, wonderful God. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Come on, let's sing it out from the top. Awesome is the sight. Awesome is the sight of your holiness. Awesome is the sight. Awesome is the sight of your holiness. Majestic is your purity. Your righteousness shines. 
shines brighter than the sun on me. Come on, sing it out. Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. Glory, glory, glory to his matchless name. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain, that was slain. From the top. Awesome is the sight of your holiness. Majestic is your purity. Your righteousness shines brighter than the sun on me. Come on, sing holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. Glory, glory, glory to his matchless name. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain, that was slain, that was slain. Come on, sing it again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. Glory, glory, glory to his matchless name. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain, that was slain, that was slain. Come on, in my spirit. My spirit magnifies the Lord, and my soul praises His name. Death could not hold Him captive, even in the grave. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Sing it again, my spirit. And my spirit magnifies the Lord. And my soul, and my soul praises his name. Death could not hold him captive, even in the grave. Jesus is Lord. Come on, one more time in my spirit. And my spirit magnifies the Lord. And my soul praises His name. Death could not hold Him captive. Even in the grave, Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God, yes, awesome is the sight of your holiness, God. Father, we bow our knee this morning, Lord God, to your Lordship. God, you are worthy of all praise. God, you are the King, King of glory, God, and we honor you, Lord. God, we thank you that you love us, that you died on the cross for our sins, God, and we give our hearts to you this morning. Speak to us through your word, Lord God. We pray, Father, for your Holy Ghost anointing. God, move in our service this morning, Lord God, as we meet online, as we fellowship online, Lord God. I pray be with every person in their living room, Lord God. Let them receive a word from you, Lord. Touch us, I pray, and bless this service in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
Well, good morning. Wasn't that magnificent? Welcome to the final Sunday morning workshop online. Great to have you guys join us today. Next week's going to be totally different and we're going to explain that in a moment. But first of all, can we please pray for a few needs we have within the church? Uh, we have some prayer requests. Number one, uh, Priscilla's father is sick in South Africa. This is Priscilla, a uh, precious member of our church. Uh, she can't get to South Africa to be with her father for obvious reasons. So obviously there's a bit of stress uh, occurring in the household. And uh, can we pray for peace for Priscilla and for the father? Uh, can we pray for an absolute miracle uh, in South Africa? Can we also pray? Uh, we've had a lot of outreaches. We've had a lot of people get saved. We've had a not lot of new believers uh, uh, join the church. Most of them we haven't met before. You know, We've got two here today. We've got a guy called Blade. Uh, he's almost as handsome as me. Uh, another guy who's here today, his name's Raji. Uh, many of you haven't met him. Uh, but can we pray for the new believers that have joined the church, these guys that we've never met? Uh, let's also pray for our pioneer churches. Most of these guys, um, they're under 100 people, so they're opening up uh, this weekend. So let's pray for their services uh, today, and let's pray for their, their reopening uh, to be fruitful. Uh, let's also pray for our pastor, Pastor Peter Field, his wife, Kerry Field, and their family. Uh, let's pray for favor, for peace, and for anointing upon their lives. And let's also pray for you. Let's also pray for whatever you need. If you're sick in your body, uh, we're going to pray for you this morning. Uh, if, if you've got uh, uh, issues in the mind, we're going to pray for you to receive peace this morning. So let's pray for you. Let's pray for each other. And let's pray for these needs quickly. Will you join me and bow your heads? Let's pray. Lord, we're praying right now, Father God, for, uh, for Priscilla. We're praying for Priscilla's father in South Africa. We're praying for supernatural healing right now, Father God. And I pray for peace. Uh, that surpasses all understanding in that household. Lord, we pray for our new disciples, Lord God, I pray. Help us, Father God, disciple them. Help them, Father God, come to church and feel at home, Father God. I pray your anointing upon their life. Uh, Father, we also pray for our pioneer churches as they open up, Father God. I pray for you to bless and anoint these churches right now. We pray for our pastor and his wife, Pastor Peter Field and Kerry. I pray for favor upon their lives. I pray for peace. I pray for anointing. Make them holy, Lord. I pray keep them uplifted. And we pray, Father God, for every member of this congregation, every person listening. I pray you heal their bodies right now. Heal their minds in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for live streaming with us here at the workshop. This is a real deal. We really are in the bush. We're going to miss these services. You know, I remember cutting a fence for Pastor Field. Uh, not too long ago, and as I cut through the fence, I smelt something weird. I opened it up, and there was a snake in the fence. There's animals everywhere. There's galahs. There's parrots. We are in the bush, and it's been an exciting time, but things are going to change because as of next week, we are going back to church, back to the body. The Bible says we can't forsake the gathering of the saints. Let's not forsake the gathering. Let's get together once again as a family, as a body, uh, because next week it's back to normal. So next Sunday morning, uh, uh, once again, we're going to be meeting at 10.30 a.m., the normal time. Uh, we're also going to be meeting at 6 p.m. This is both on Sunday. 10.30 a.m. and 6 p.m. Next Sunday, it's back to normal. And same again on Wednesday night. We are also meeting Wednesday night back at the building at 7.30 p.m., Please have a look at the website for details. Uh, we're going to be meeting in the same place, that Strathpine State School Hall. So join us there for service kicking off next Sunday. Hallelujah. Now we do have a few announcements uh, today for you. Uh, announcement number one is I just wanted to highlight uh, what our pastor's been doing behind the scenes. Many people don't know about this and it's a magnificent ministry. We've got a few photos for you. But our pastor's kind of like been re-pioneering uh, himself. You know, he's been running church, he's been running the workshop, he's been running his family. But him and his daughter Nat, they've been pioneering uh, uh, another work in a place called Marantha. Now this, uh, this place, uh, it's an old person's home. Uh, and these precious people, they can't get out like we can get out. They can't go to church like we can go to church. So our pastor and, uh, and Natalie, uh, they've made it their calling to go there every other Thursday to preach the gospel. And the amazing thing is, people like this that you see on the screen today, they've been getting saved. And isn't that a valuable thing? So we just wanted to let you know what's been happening behind the scenes. 
uh, during this whole downtime. Amen. So good job uh, to Pastor Field and Nat in that area. Uh, we do have another uh, announcement for you today. In fact, we've got a report from, a, uh, from Sam Akers, and he's going to report on what we did yesterday uh, during uh, our first impact team in a while. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Pastor Dax. All right. <laughs> so yesterday we had an impact team to the, the church in Beanley, Pastor Bobby Woods. Uh, the, I was thinking about how to sum up or how to explain what yesterday was like. And I think the best word I can think of, it was amazing. Yes. Come on. Uh, at one o'clock we met up. We had about 40 people, maybe more from our church. They'd carted along there. The husbands, wives, the kids, everyone from mm. their family. We had massive groups there. We came along and the thing that I loved about it, Pastor Bobby Woods, many of you know him. Many of you know that he is uh, an incredible singer, but also he understands worship. And one of the first things that we did was we sang, right? We sang two songs. And the thing that I loved about it, and this is, I guess, to give a little bit of a plug to the service next week when we do come back together and encouragement to come along. When two or more are gathered and when you sing praise to God, I tell you, man, there was a Holy Ghost atmosphere there there was an expectation there was excitement and it was so incredible everyone being together and just just singing and just just being in fellowship with each other god god in that moment god was doing things we then went out we hit the streets we grabbed some flyers to tell people about the grand opening that was happening the same time as us on july 12th and i reckon every person i spoke to was receptive I had people uh, that, that we were encountering that, that were, you know, oh my goodness, my auntie knows this person who knows this person who knows that church. Oh, come along. Oh my goodness. It was incredible. Uh, there were people saved over this, this, uh, this impact team yesterday. It was only four hours, but I'll tell you what, it was a very impacting four hours. And I want to encourage you as well, if you've never been to an impact team, you know, maybe you're concerned, may maybe you've got kids and you're worried that, you know, uh, it might be difficult. Well, I'd encourage you to come along anyway. Bring them. Because, I mean, you know, uh, we had a number of families that had their kids there. Um, there, were, there was facilities there to accommodate to that, to account for that. God was able to move through them, able to touch them as well as their family, as well as set an example for their kids of what God can do when you're faithful and when you reach out and when you step out and you evangelize. Um, yeah, that's a basic summary of, uh, of the Impact Team. Thanks, Pastor Dax. Man, brilliant. Yeah, I was so excited and impacted as well. It was one of those nights last night I just couldn't sleep because I was so full of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's something when you see young men and young women street preaching, it does something in you. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to come along to the next one, uh, even the next outreach. Uh, let's all get involved in this and, and watch what God does. Can I also quickly say on a, on a side note, like next week at church, we're going to have a lot of new believers come in. I'm talking there's going to be new believers everywhere. And uh, I want to encourage you, uh, uh, you know, part of being a Christian is fulfilling God's great commission. And uh, Jesus said just before he ascended, you know, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Part of it was to make disciples. Uh, next Sunday, you know, you're not going to find me uh, holding my wife's hand. I love you, Rose. And she knows this. But I'll be looking for the new believers, man. I'll be, I'll be looking for these guys that are brand new in church and I will be aiming for them. I love my friends. I love my family. But uh, my main focus in church is going to be to make disciples. So can I encourage you next week, find some new people. Uh, don't, don't, don't join the normal cliques. You can catch up with a coffee for them later. Find these new guys. Make them feel comfortable. Start to teach them. Start to help them. And uh, start to pour your heart into them. That's discipleship. It's what we're called to do. It's going to be amazing next week. There's going to be new believers everywhere. What we've been praying for for years. So uh, let's get involved in that. Now, a few quick uh, short uh, announcements. Uh, we have church tonight, 6 p.m. Please join us tonight. It's going to be an exciting sermon. We also have on Tuesday a church uh, a letterbox drop. In fact, we're calling it Operation Letterbox Drop because we've got thousands of flyers. Now, if, if Dave and Raji don't uh, uh, you know, get rid of all the flyers by then, we, we should have 5,000 flyers to deliver. And if we can all get involved in this, if we can get 100 people there, that's only 50 houses each. So uh, let's get involved and um, I'll, I'll send the details out via text where we're meeting, what time we're meeting on Tuesday night. It'll be a blessing to have all hands on deck for this. Amen. Well, that's it for announcements. Uh, let's take the offering this morning. One of my favorite parts of the service. Amen. You know, there's a, there's a teacher I enjoy watching online. Uh, I, get, I, I watch him sometimes. He's got this whiteboard behind him. Uh, you know, he teaches uh, very well uh, you know, on, on topics like the rapture. 
etc. But this week I was I was watching one of his teachings uh, uh, on tithing, and uh, you know I was I was very checked by what he was saying, and um, he there was something kinked in his spirit. This guy started ranting and raving about pastors preaching on tithing. Apparently every, every second sermon we preach is on tithing. And, uh, and it turns out this guy, his church is church in the cloud, I think it's called. And, and he doesn't attend church. He's got a kink in his spirit in reference to tithing. And this guy was so focused on tithing is the law. Uh, it was the law, which was correct. Okay, it was the law. Uh, but can I, can I encourage you, this is not the only teaching on tithing. You know, this guy was saying tithing is the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Yes and yes. But what he didn't mention was tithing was around way before the law. We're talking about Abraham, way before the Red Sea was parted, way before uh, the stones uh, were written by the hand of God, the laws of God, uh, the laws of Moses. Way before that, a guy called Abraham tithed faithfully through a guy called Melchizedek, who was a royal uh, uh, priest uh, to the temple. And uh, he tithed faithfully. This guy didn't focus on that. He didn't say, oh, it, it happened before the law. He also didn't focus on what happened after the law. He didn't say, Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. God, Jesus never said, stop tithing. No, he said, give to God what belongs to God. Can I tell you, church, there's a lot of false teachings out there. There's a lot of funky doctrine. There's a lot of people checked in their spirit in reference to tithing. Can I encourage you? Ignore them. Be faithful to God because tithing is the key to a lot of areas. One of the areas is the windows of heaven are going to open and he doesn't promise you're going to get rich. I've never seen a Christian get rich from tithing, but he pours out a blessing, uh, such a great blessing that you're never going to be able to contain. And that can come in many, many, many different ways. I encourage you, start tithing, man. It's key. It's brilliant. It's awesome. We love it. And uh, it will really set you free in the, in the area of finances. Amen. Well, just before we start, we're going to have a quick transition, uh, but I want to introduce, sorry, not introduce, you know him, I want to welcome our very own senior pastor, Pastor Field, who's going to come in straight after the transition. back everybody and thank you for uh, your liberality. I was thinking how we've just got so much going on at the moment. In fact on Friday night we also had our Grey Power Bible study and uh, thank you so much to Ron and Jane who hosted that and uh, Dave Brown our resident preacher that led that study and uh, I've heard nothing but excellent reports about the night that you had together. Uh, also remember that we did announce the other night that we're going to be going into our Bible conference this year in August as originally planned and scheduled and uh, we've even got our artwork ready to go. Uh, but I'm going to ask you, please pray for us. We've, we've got to find the right facility to do this because of the government rulings. But we are proceeding with our Bible conference and uh, we'll probably put the dates up for you at the end. The reason I'm highlighting that is very possibly you've got to get permission from work. We need our congregation, all but everybody from our church to be there. If you can be there to help us with the conference in August. Well, Jeremiah 29, if you'd like to go in your Bible today, Jeremiah chapter 29. With the current global upheaval and all of the madness and things that are going on, uh, I was contemplating how there's so much negativity, so many bad reports, so much concern about economies and real estate. It was a buyer's market. And I was reading the other day, suddenly prices are sliding downwards and People are anxious about this and there's con confusion about people's superannuation and what should I do and do we trust the banks? And, and it, it, it highlights what I think is, is very important and that is that a lot of people when they have all of these concerns need to remember if they're saved that God is in control and He is a very, very good God and regardless of what is going on around us, we must constantly come back to this truth. 
Secondly, with that wonderful truth on who God is, is he has given us his church for our benefit. And I'm like everybody, I'm so pleased that next Sunday morning we're going to see each other in person. You're not going to be looking at one another through a screen anymore, but you're going to be able to be together on church next Sunday morning. Uh, just It's just going to be a service. And then at night, we're actually going to highlight a big fellowship together as well. But that's going to be so good to do that. But I want to look in the Bible with you today in Jeremiah chapter 29. And it's verses of scripture that are probably very familiar to somebody who's heard lots of preaching and been around their Bible. But it's very familiar scripture because it's such amazingly encouraging verses of scripture. And this is in Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm going to read verse 11 uh, to 14. If you want to follow along, but we'll give it to you on the screen as well so that you have it in front of you. But God says this, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. And when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. Now, what I want to examine with you today from our Bibles, I really do want us to be encouraged. And I want to break this into two parts if I can. But I want us to, first of all, Give our minds to the truth that he is with us. God is with us. Now, this is almost impossible to comprehend with the natural mind that how can a God who is omnipresent is everywhere? How can a God who has created everything? How can a God who is so big that says that he can hold the oceans in the palm of his hand? How could we comprehend that he'd actually be with us? In fact, whenever we consider anybody of importance or even a dignitary, we, we expect separation. Uh, I was thinking how many, many years ago I was in California in Los Angeles and somebody took me through Hollywood the first time I'd ever gone through there and people have heard of Hollywood and, and uh, you can go down all these driveways and all these beautiful gardens and there's a gate here and a gate there and you can actually buy these little maps of vendors on the street side they let you know which famous movie star lives in that place and there's all these big gates and things and that's because these these are important people at least in their own heads anyway these are important people and so you can't access them well let me tell you about god is god is not like that it's amazing that we we think of a dignitary unapproachable uh you know division and yet god is not like that he is actually with us He's not virtually unapproachable and he's not out of reach. Even the fact that in this text, he says to us, listen, come and talk to me. His name, Emmanuel, means God is with us. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8, it says, He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck and stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land. O oh, Emmanuel. This is what is incredible about being saved, is that God has come to live in us and to be with us. And this is the great benefit of being saved, is that we have fellowship with a risen saviour. The word fellowship in Greek, koinonia, it actually means partnership or participation or social interaction. And that means when we're saved, we are in with the best. We are connected to the greatest dignitary that there has ever been. This is why the cross is so important. We can never get away from the cross and the importance of the cross. It's central in our understanding of being born again in Christianity yeah? because the cross is where God has broken down and he's removed that barrier that divided us from him. It's because of the cross that we have immediate access in Ephesians 2 verse 14, it says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. That means we're with him 
and He's with us. That regardless of what's going on in life, regardless of what this crazy, crazy world is doing, God is still with us and He knows us. Listen to Psalm 139, verse 2. He says, uh, you know, the psalmist says, speaking of God, you know my sitting down and my rising up, you understand. I want to encourage you today is that God understands you. Every thought that you have, every fear and apprehension that you are trying to come to terms with, every trial that you're experiencing right now, the confusion, the uncertainty, the questions, the doubts about the future. Listen, God understands you. He knows you're rising up. He knows you're lying down. As you go to bed at night, those things that fill your mind that sometimes are plaguing, you wake up in the night, you think of them, you get up in the morning and those situations are still there. I know it is so difficult for us to comprehend, but I want to encourage you today. He understands. He knows you. He's with you. Because that's what Jesus did through the cross. His omnipresence, we have his favor. He is above us. He is below us. He is in front of us. He is behind us. In Isaiah 52, 12, the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Think about the children of Israel as they're escaping Egypt. This is, this is, this is a, a very, very heart-wrenching, a very nerve-wracking experience. This is a people who have been treated with prejudice and dominated for, for literally hundreds of years. They have no rights. They've lacked confidence. And they're running from the most powerful army, the most powerful uh, military global nation. They're running for their lives. God has worked incredible miracles for them. But listen, these are not war people. These are not people trained in warfare. These are not people that have weapons. And they're on the way. God's done these amazing miracles. They're on the exodus. And think about it. They're on the way to the promised land. Now, that is a type of us today as believers. When we get saved, we get taken out of Egypt. And we are on the way to the promised land. And the promised land is heaven. And during that exodus, as the children of Israel were running, as they were fleeing, as the Bible says, from Egypt... God never left them for one single moment. He was with them the entire time. Exodus 13, 20 to 22. So they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. That is amazing. What that verse tells us is God was with them the entire time. Night, day, night and day, he never left them. He never left their side. He never abandoned them one time. And as they were passing and traveling and journeying on that very, very difficult experience, he was with them constantly. And let me tell you, that's exactly how he is today with us. He's with you all the time. It doesn't matter what you're going through, the good times, the bad time. He is God, Emmanuel. He is God who is with us and his thoughts towards you are good. I want to encourage you that even when you perhaps feel like you are going through things that are unbearable, he's still there and he will use those things for good. Because sometimes when things seem like they're at the worst, it's when they're about to mend. In Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. The Philippians translation puts it, moreover, we know that to those who love God, who are called according to his plan, everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. See, everything, I want to encourage you, everything about your life, God has got your future planned. And he has got it covered. He has secured your future. It doesn't matter what the banks and the government, it doesn't matter what all of the, all the, all the prophets of doom and all the soothsayers and all the negative writers, it doesn't matter what they're saying. I want to tell you, God has got your future. He secured it. In our text, the NIV puts it like this from verse 11, 
For I know the plans that I have toward you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And that is why we can face our lives with confidence. That regardless of what comes along, he's with us and he'll stand by us. Now, the other point that I want to highlight today is his church. So we know that God is with us. We know that he's faithful. He is an unchangeable God. He's consistent, the same yesterday, today, forever. And he's with us all the time. But you know the other wonderful thing that he has given us to help us know we have confidence in the future is he's given us his church. And you know, I am so pleased about the fact that from next Sunday morning, we're actually going to get together again as a church. And I'm going to draw upon that in just a moment. But let's think about the church. Because I realize that one of the easiest mistakes that I've seen made over many, many years now is the mistake when people underestimate the blessing of belonging to the local church. And what's so sad is that I've seen many people walk away, but it is usually to their own demise. The outcome is often not very good for people who walk away. Because a church auditorium, it's often referred to as a sanctuary. Sometimes you hear people announce no food in the sanctuary. It's a bit of a weird word. It's like, well, I didn't realize we we're going to go and pat the birds. Well, no, no, not the bird sanctuary. But, and it's not, it's not a way that people speak in everyday language. But often the auditorium where the people gather, it's referred to as a sanctuary. But it's referred to that for a good reason. Because a sanctuary is a refuge. It's a haven. It's a safe place. It's like a harbor. It's perhaps like where boats can come in from a storm and they can moor in the harbor, that they can be protected from the battering winds and perhaps the, the crashing of the waves in, the, in stormy weather. But see, that is a wonderful picture of what a local church is. And so there's a number of multiple benefits that you and I have. And remember, we're talking about when we're living in uncertain times of the way the world is. It's my personal opinion that we are in the last days. I absolutely believe things are changing so fast now. But there's a number of things then, important benefits about the church that helps us. One of those is the fact that a church is a holy place. And I don't mean a holy place like a cathedral because it's got uh, you know, we've got stained glass windows and there's some beautiful things with gold thread and special drapes that hang over the, over the, over the, the altar space. Uh, but it, church is a holy place in that it's somewhere that is set apart from the corruption of the world. And we all know how corrupt living in this world is. Seven days a week trying to come to terms with trying to live right and do right and we come face to face constantly with the corruption. And yet this is why church is a great thing. It's a place where there are boundaries. It's a place uh, where uh, it comes uh, with, with standards and certain things. They don't change. It's a place where the word of God continues to be the final authority. It's a city of refuge. In the, in the Old Testament, the city of refuge was a city where somebody, uh, if they had perhaps been involved in an accident uh, and somebody was killed, maybe they, they accidentally, somebody died from, the, uh, from, from manslaughter and until it had been reconciled and the evidence examined uh, a person to protect themselves, they could run, they could flee to a city of refuge and they could hole up there until things were processed. I want to tell you that that's what a church is. A church is a city of refuge. It's a place where righteousness and truth is upheld and it's protected. A church is also a place where the presence of God is found. 
You know, if you just listen to uh, uh, just the report of the impact team to Bean Lee and what Sam was saying, just about the people getting together and he didn't know what I was going to preach and many references that have been made today already, they don't know what I was going to preach. Uh, uh, Pastor Dax, the things that he's mentioning. Uh, but you see, again, this is one of the great things uh, about being in church uh, is because God delights to dwell in the midst of his people. In Matthew 18, 20, in fact, I think it was uh, Sam who mentioned this. Uh, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Now, the emphasis, of course, is the people. It's not the building. But where God's people gather together, that's where the presence of God comes. And this is another thing that we should never take for granted. It's the visitation of the presence of God. I mentioned uh, 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 during the week, the last weekend, I was with the church in Lismore. Kerry and I were there and I got to preach at four different services and be with the people. Let me tell you, from the very first night, there was such a tangible presence of God. It was like he'd been waiting for everyone to get together as well so he could be there. And that grace that's upon that Lismore congregation, it was there the entire time. And yet a number of people made the comment to me. They said, you know, there's something about the town of Blismore, there's a darkness about it, isn't it? And you know what? That's true because there's all kinds of witchcraft and crazy people down there, but not in the church. When you get in the church and the presence of God there, it was amazing the difference. And this is why we must never take this for granted. Psalm 26 verse 8, David wrote in his song, he said, Lord, I've loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Another reason why church is such a wonderful thing for us is it's the house of prayer. And you know, this is one thing I am so looking forward to uh, is being able to just pray with you again, pray with you as a congregation when we get together. Because it's, when, when you get saints that are in a common location to pray, it's where you can make intercessions. It's where you can bring petitions. It's where you bring supplications before God. And there's something incredible about a scheduled, regular time for seeking God together with other people. There is, of course, accountability that comes with that, being on time. In other words, we're going to schedule, we're going to pray at this particular time. And those disciplines, those little disciplines are very healthy. Yeah? But it's amazing when you get together with other people and begin to pray of what can happen. Think back to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, where the believers were praying together in a corporate prayer meeting. And it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is amazing. It was as they got together physically, as they gathered together corporately in one place. That's literally what the Bible says. And they were praying. Prayer is just conversation. They were speaking to God. It was a collective. And as they did that, the presence of God was drawn. The Holy Spirit came and the Bible says fell upon them and they were filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit. And the evidence of that was they began to speak in other tongues. Let me encourage you today. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, somewhere that can most certainly happen is in the prayer meeting. It's when you get with other believers and they are praying and the presence of God is drawn to that and he visits those people and the Holy Ghost can fall upon you. And that is why the prayer room, it is the engine room of any church. The prayer meeting is critical. So, so furious that it was when he found the house of prayer and people had turned it into something else. They, they'd turn it into an opportunity to sit around and gossip. They'd turn it into an opportunity to set up their Tupperware parties and set up all of their pyramid uh, uh, selling schemes. Uh, they, they found it as an opportunity to put out their birthday invitations and their gender reveal parties. But they didn't pray. And Jesus said, you know what? This is not right. This is a house of prayer. And he drove out those offenders. 
And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. Listen, in Jeremiah, what is it the prophet says? Verse 11, he says, You will call upon me. He's repeating what God's saying. You will call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. This is the one of the great, great benefits of belonging to a local church. It's getting with other believers and it's praying. Another great benefit that God has given us to protect us in church is it's where the Word of God is preached. You see, worshipping God always precedes His entry and then His speaking. If you ever want to get involved in worship ministry, I want you to prick up your ears. You see, the worship before anything else in a church service is not just to use up time. It's not to entertain people. But the worship is to usher in the presence of God, but to cause people to begin to connect their hearts to God. This is always done because it precedes God speaking the Word of God. This is why it's critical that we hear the preaching of the Word of God. See, when the people have gathered, and Thad even prayed this this morning, but after the people have gathered and they've worshipped, God will then come and anoint his word as he speaks it to his people. And this is what our church is. This is why our church is a place where we can find direction and protection via his word. In Ephesians 4, when it speaks about evangelists and pastors and preachers and teachers, and so teachers, uh, anybody who teaches the Word of God, it's one man discipling another. It's Sunday school teachers teaching the children. It's ladies gathering over a cup of tea and studying the Bible. And a more mature lady teaching a younger lady. It's a pastor preaching a sermon. It's evangelists preaching an evangelistic campaign. But what it is, is it's the preaching of the Word of God. This is why I'm so excited that we are going forward in faith and we have scheduled our Bible conference. Because a Bible conference is a conference. Many times people get together so many of these free company conferences and government conferences. What it really means is we're going to get three free meals in a hotel room. But do you know what a conference really is? A conference is a conference. It's where something is conferred. And what it is in this case is it's God's word being conferred. It's God's word being put onto somebody or being put into somebody. This is why gathering together as his community, it's where he gives us his counsel. Ecclesiastes 12, 9 to 10, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered, sought out, set in order many proverbs, and the preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. See, it's words of truth pertaining to everything for living a successful life. And that's why in this turbulent world, your local church is the best place you could ever have. Because it's where you're going to hear and learn about relationships. It's where you can get independent counsel about marriage. It's where you learn how to be a better parent. It's where you learn to relate to other people. It's where you learn how to raise children. I mean, the list is endless. And these are things that come when we're part of that local church. Now, there's one final thing that I want to emphasize the benefit as well that comes when we are part of that local church because we have incredible security in knowing God's with us. But we also have incredible security in his local church. But this last one is the benefit of the fellow believers. The fellow believers. You know, one of the great blessings of life is when you belong to a church family. And you've often heard that phrase used at our church and sometimes I'd kind of hear it and go, you know, hello church, family, whatever. It, kind of, it sounds kind of cute, doesn't it? It's a little bit kind of soft maybe. But it's true. 
because the brethren are men and women who share the same spiritual father. And that spiritual father is obviously uh, most importantly and primarily, it's our, it's our father in heaven. But it's when you share relationship with men who have the same vision, they have the same standard in their personal life due to convictions, and it's men who have the same priorities. Now consider a brother. This is where you get them. You get them in church. Because a brother in Christ is like a comrade in arms. And I was looking up the definition of this word uh, brethren or, or brother, Just and this is secular mostly. Brother in arms are soldiers fighting together on the same side. And the other definition or way that often the word brother is used is in the phrase, be one's brother's keeper. And what that simply means is to be responsible for the behavior of a relative, a friend or an associate. This is amazing. This is something God's given us in a church. That when we are part of that church, it means that our, that our brothers and our sisters, these are people who help keep us on track. They help keep us accountable. They help keep us that we toe the line, if you will. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ are one of the most priceless gems of Christianity. That's why it is very sad when someone abandons the brethren. When a brother in arms just ups and leaves their post and just walks away from that. And anybody can do that at any time. Any sister, you can do that at any time. It's your prerogative. The door swings both ways on a church. It's a volunteer organization. No one can com compel anybody to be there or do that. It's of your own volition. I have to make the decision. I want to do this and I want this to be part of of my life but I want to tell you it is so tragic when someone throws this away because the value of a future with friends becomes more pronounced when you consider an existence without friends and here is the cardinal mistake that people make is when the enemy gets in their head and at times begins to mess with their head about the church and about where they fit and do they want to be there, not be there. And the enemy comes in and what he does is he begins, uh, he begins to massage that negative thought. And as that person begins to entertain this, the problem is they forget about an existence without the friends. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 11 says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Listen now, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? See, you need friends. And we live in a, in a, in a social, anti-social world now. We call it social media and social connecting. And now we've got social distancing. But I want to tell you, friend, you need socializing. You need friends. This poem says, thank you, friend. And it says, I never came to you, my friend. I went away without some new enrichment of the heart. More faith and less of doubt. More courage in the days ahead. And often in great need coming to you, I went away comforted indeed. How can I find the shining word, the glowing phrase that tells all that your love has meant to me, all that your friendship spills? There is no word, no phrase for you on whom I so depend. All I can say to you is this, God bless you, precious friend. So I want to present a question to you. Do you genuinely value the brethren enough? And be honest with yourself. Ignore your pride for a moment. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Do you really genuinely value your brothers? Do you value your sisters in Christ? They've got to be saved. That's what that means. Born again. A relationship with Jesus. Do you really value that relationship? 
What does your church and your brothers mean to you personally? And I hope if you're listening today that you're someone that you've got festering attitudes or you've allowed things to to get under your skin that are really unnecessary, they're incidental. They can come out of your own pride. They can come out of your own bitterness even. But my friend, I pray that you're listening and the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Because there's nothing more tragic to me over the years of serving God when I hear back stories now of people who decided, no, I don't need church anymore. I don't need to do that. And then I hear the demise and I hear the tragedy of how their life has gone. I'm not suggesting for a moment that this is the only church. There are hundreds of great churches that people can attend and be part of. But I do know that this church is one of them. And I want you to ask yourself, how much do the brethren mean to you? That local church that God has designed to protect you and bless you and help you and serve you, how much does it mean to you? Do you know the word brother appears 113 times in the New Testament and the word brethren appears 226 times. Listen, any word God puts in his Bible that often is something that needs to get our attention and we need to look at it. This word in Greek actually is the word adelphos. And what it means is from the same womb. Now that's talking about spiritually. From the same womb, it means that we belong to the same people. It means that we are united to one another by a bond of affection. Jesus prioritized our relationships. The relationships that we have with spiritual brothers and sisters, and he made this perfectly clear. And I'm going to bring this down for you, but I want you to pay very close attention as you think about the blessing of his church, which is designed for you. Jesus makes it perfectly clear. He's preaching one day and his own physical family arrive. His mother's there. His brothers are there. They want to speak to him. And the disciples interrupt him. And in Matthew chapter 12, 48 to 49, but he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. That is a powerful object lesson. The point that Jesus was making is the people that were most important were the people that he was connected to spiritually. Those from the same spiritual womb. And then in the very next verse of Matthew chapter 12, the same chapter, verse 50, he said, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, if you're listening and that's this, these verses are new to you, please understand, he's not dismissing his own family. He loved his own mother. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, his mother was at the foot of the cross, shattered, heartbroken, crying her eyes out at his son hanging there. And Jesus made sure she was taken care of. He, he spoke to the beloved disciple and said, make sure you take care of my mum." Jesus loved his own flesh and blood family. But what Jesus was simply saying is that when you are converted and he places you in the family of God, you should treasure, you should value that family very, very highly. Michael D. Marlowe said, physical brotherhood is not as important as spiritual brotherhood and whatever a man's earthly family may be, his true brothers are the ones who have the same father in heaven. For this reason, the word brethren was used by the followers of Jesus when they spoke for one another. See, before people abandon or jettison their church, They need to really sit down and stop and think about what they're doing. And if I could appeal to you today, if you're at that place right now, please listen to what I'm saying, even if you don't like me. Please stop and think about what you're doing. Because I can tell you that the percentage track record of what I've seen when people do this over the years is very bad. Very bad. I don't hear many good stories at all. You need to really stop and check yourself and say, how much does being a valuable member of a congregation, how much does it really mean to you? Because part of God's protection for your life is giving you a church that you can belong to.
and your church is your spiritual family. There is nothing, there is nothing even as close or comparable to the church family. I'm going to finish, but in Acts 13, 26, it says, Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. Very, very clear that when people are saved and God places them in a family, is that God puts them there for their protection and for their advantage. And I want to encourage you and leave you with this word from Jeremiah today. God has a future. He has a plan for you. If you will pray, if you will speak to him, and if you will allow yourself to be a blessing, to be a contributing member of his local church, the place that he's placed you, my friend, you'll be the one that will reap the benefits. And it doesn't matter what this turbulent world does, you're going to be okay and you're going to come through this and it's going to be just fine. I want to pray with you this morning and perhaps if you're someone that you are have joined us for this live stream from the workshop and you're not a Christian, you're not born again, or maybe you're backslidden, you're not right with God, I'm going to pray a very, very simple prayer for you and with you now. And all you have to do is speak this and mean it from your heart. And Jesus, Jesus who's right here, my friend, he wants to be part of your life. He wants to fill your heart. I want you to pray this with me. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I admit I've broken your commandments. I'm not right. My heart is not right with you. You are a holy God and I am a sinner. But I thank you for the cross which has removed the separation between us because of your forgiveness for me. Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Saviour. Give me the strength. Give me the power to live for you and to tell other people about you. Thank you for saving me. I pray in faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, my friend, if you just prayed that sinner's prayer. And uh, wherever you are in the world, if you will contact us through our website, we will make sure that there's somebody to support you in your decision. There's many wonderful churches all around the world, and whichever nation you're in, whichever city you're in, wherever you are, we will find somebody to be a help to you because we want you to make it as a believer. And Jesus wants to put you in one of his churches. But as we wrap this up today, please remember he is Emmanuel, God who is with us. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Wherever you are, whatever you are going through, he's with you right now. Just speak to him. And secondly, remember that his church is your church. He designed it for you to be a blessing to you. And you must value that. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on the workshop. It's been such a, a privilege to preach and to join everybody from our congregation, but also people from all around the world that you tune into the workshop. We're back again tonight at 6 p.m. And just remember again, uh, we are going ahead in faith with our Bible conference in August. This is going to be from Wednesday the 12th until Saturday, lunchtime, Saturday the 15th of August. And so we're going ahead. Um, the address is TBA, which means to be advised, which really means we haven't got a clue yet where we're going to have the conference. But we are people of faith in our congregation, and so we are proceeding forward with that. And so please take the dates down, and especially from our church in Brisbane, Get the time off from your boss. We need you to be there to work and to help and to make this conference what it will be with our congregations involved. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. We're looking forward to being back with you again tonight at 6 p.m. May God bless you and your household. Enjoy some fellowship with somebody right now. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed this service. Just a friendly reminder that we will be resuming our live services again soon in just a few weeks. But until then, you can watch our, our services on YouTube and check us out at www.pottershousebrisbane.com. We meet at 10am on a Sunday, 
6 p.m. on a Sunday night and again at 7.30 on a Wednesday night. Thank you so much and we'll see you soon.